Okay, let's start with a really easy. Um, Mike, how did you end up getting into aviation? Why, how did you end up on the stage? <laughs> We have a steady customer base, so I think we met our targets because uh, we didn't increase the customer base, but we were still able to meet the targets. Richard? Yeah, I think it was, it was quite a lot of hard work, um, but like Mike said, it wasn't the most amazing year, and um, hopefully today we can figure out what you can do to improve it. I think uh, last year was tough, yes, it wasn't as bad, I think, as Mike uh, appears to, to be. And I think I see positive uh, <coughs> growth signs this year, not only uh, the UAE, but also some of the markets around us, which I'm sure we're going to talk about. Rob, you're, you're in a unique market, I think, very much. BBJ, BCJ, focus. How was your year last year? Yeah, I don't know if you read uh, what we said at the Saudi Air Show, but 2018 was actually a record year for Rosjet in the 15 years we've been around. So, so we're feeling pretty good, and, and, and actually, I like, that, I, I like to hear that the last couple of years haven't been great because if they haven't been great, maybe things could get even better for us. So, so I have to say, you're right, we have a unique market, we have a unique customer base. Um, we are the niche BBJ operator, and, and so maybe things are different for us, but it's, it's been quite good for us. If the Saudi market comes back, if some other things happen, it could be even better, so I'm excited about that. So I do have that optimism for the future, but, but no, I, maybe it's because we've, we've made some... Uh, made some tweaks and some changes and some efficiencies, but it was a very good year for us on that side. Maybe it's the charter side. Does anyone have any high points of the last year? Anything you would, you know, just try and make this cheery and happy? Anyone, anything, you know, charter market is strong for Roger? We, we did a lot more uh, maintenance business together with our uh, friends of Lufthansa Techniques, so we're really starting to do a lot more on the, the Airbus corporate jet and the BBJs, so that's, Although, well, you know, we have a lot more capacity to go forward, but that's, uh, that's a positive element. We're getting more known, we're getting more capabilities, so that's an important element in our offering mix, basically. What's your biggest headache, Richard? What's your biggest problem day to day? Um, I think everybody would agree that um, setting customer expectations is probably something that we need to work on quite hard but also it's figuring out what we can do to further innovate and actually, you know, create value to clients when they're starting to wonder, you know, should I own this aircraft? Are there programs around which I can you know, do it cheaper through charter or programs for fixed hours or things like that? It's just getting an understanding of, you know, where we need to go next. In, in a fairly complicated business, how we can simplify it just through, you know, innovation and, you know, forward-looking attitudes. That's interesting, isn't it? Because one of the things people have always said about the Middle East is that <coughs> companies want to own and not charter. They want, or, and do you see that changing? Yeah, listen, I think that's one of our biggest headaches for Middle East at the moment. Our, the composition of our fleet has changed over the last few years. The days when we had 40% uh, fleet, 30% available for charter are gone. We're struggling at the moment to try and find owners that actually want to put the aircraft up for charter. Um, so likewise, when I hear, and I do see some of the other operators are doing some good charter flying, unfortunately we're just not in the game at the moment because we don't have the fleet. And why don't they want the fleet? Because they want, are they using, they, using the aircraft so much that they can't? It's not that they're using it so much. I think there's some of them are new owners with a new mindset that it's mine, I don't want to share it. Um, and, and rightly so, you know, when you understand that they're paying a lot of money for it with their own um, touch and, and personal touch in the aircraft, they don't want to share that. And, and they don't really need that little bit of charter margin that it brings. And also, I guess, are any of them looking at technically going the extra 
depreciation it just isn't made up for the charter out of support? No, it, it, it hasn't come to that, but um, yeah, there has been one or two discussions where clearly they're starting to understand that, hang on, that's a few more cycles, it does do something to the life of the aircraft and the end value. Captain Andrew, have you got anything positive for Yeah, so the good thing about our company is that we have, all eggs are not in the same basket, we have so many things which we are expanding. And we, we knew the charter market is part of our business, but we also have grown hugely into MRO business, which we are now invested in uh, Dubai South into a new hangar, which is our future this year, starting in, uh, next month. And then we have uh, MBO, and we have helicopter charter business, which is adding to this charter. So this kind of vast <coughs> collage gives us, you know, fairly we are going to spread our business on all these segments. So it's a good thing for us. We are growing into, when everyone is slowing down, we are growing. So that's a good thing for us. That's yeah. the only way to survive at the moment. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Just want to say, I can echo that the mix of the business between the management, the FPO, the maintenance, in our case, hangar parking as well, it's an important thing. We're not that active in the charter market, would like to do a bit more there, but uh, it's, it's the mix which makes it happen, yes. As long as you don't come into the BBJ level, we're okay with more charter. <laughs> but the same thing with us is, is diversification is a key. Even though our charter business is doing well, say our FBO business hasn't been. It's, it's, been, it's been going down in, in small increments, but not all businesses is, is rising. So, so I would agree. And we don't do aircraft management, so that's why we're, we have a positive view right now, maybe. We've got some questions coming in from the audience. Um, are there really new owners? Um, coming into the Middle East market, or, or is it just that it's upgrading and renewing? No, I, I, you want to highlight for, for ExecuJet last year? Yeah, we managed to find two brand new first time owners, pre owned aircraft, but that was encouraging the market conditions that there were two new owners that had come from nowhere. <laughs> yeah, similarly, we had also. Uh, First time, first time buyers, first time uh, owners, yes. And again, pre-owned aircraft first, so that seems the way people get into the business. Let's do a really nice question. Um, for those of you who manage aircraft, hands up if your fleet grew last year. If your fleet grew last year. Do we want to do hands up <laughs> if it declined? It's been declining for us year on year. Um, and, and yes, it sounds like you know the fleet has gone down, and our fleet over the last five, six years, you know, we've lost 40% of the fleet. But if you have a look at how many of those aircraft were actually sold out of the region, totally out of your control. On that. Um, so we've had a lot of that in, uh, and unfortunately, a lot of those were our charter missions. We we had the same fleet, no growth, no reduction. But like I said earlier, this is this is the time where we need to work extra hard with these aircraft owners to ensure, you know, that they can afford to continue operating the aircraft. You know, it's when it comes to these tough times we've seen in the past is that, you know, people stop talking to each other, maybe stop flying less, the bills take a little bit longer to get paid, and ultimately if you don't engage and don't act and you know, cooperate, you just end up with an aeroplane parked on a ramp under, you know, an inch of dust. So nobody wants that. So while we're not maybe growing it, we, we are working very hard on ensuring that you know, we're spreading the asset as much as possible. So there's another, talking about spreading the asset, another nice question from the audience. How are passenger demands changing in the region? What about the number of flight hours per aircraft? There is an awful lot. There's some aircraft who, who uh, don't fly an awful lot, don't fly the same routes most of the time, and there are others which are extremely actively used. That, that really depends on the owner. I don't think year over year there's been a, a big change in that. No. Anyone else wants to come? The one thing I see in the airline industry, the first class segment is going down. You know, they, they are going to downsize that. That will give impetus to the uh, private jets, I think. I, I feel that that's the direction to go. Well, and if you take what, what the two gentlemen said about the, um, the new buyers buying used aircraft as compared to maybe in the past there was a lot of new aircraft being, being bought in, 
On the charter market, it's the same same change. I would say is that the age of the aircraft isn't isn't a big deal these days. They, a lot of customers just don't ask if the interior's nice, if it's a good experience, it's a good service, and that kind of thing. And if the price is right, then then they're they're happy to, to fly on that aircraft. So I know when I was in in Saudi with NAS 15 years ago, age was everything. Age. Well, I don't want to fly on an aircraft less than five years old or, or more than five years old, and and you know, make sure it's, it's the age and when was the interior done and that kind of thing. It's, it's price driven a lot these days. Maybe a little bit less than it was a year and a half, two years ago. There's a little bit more uh, uh, decision making around around other things, around maybe the, the date of the refurb or, or something like that, but less than it used to be for sure. I think also, I think this part of the world, they change the cars every five years. So they think that jets need to be doing the same, but I think number should be 10 to 20 years, not 5. Or more. Are you seeing new charter customers coming? Are we seeing a, or is it still the standard? Are we seeing a, a new generation come in and discover? Well, I can't really talk to them. Because <laughs> I would love them to come knock on the door. But no, I, I think the thing with us is once um, the region understands that you don't have charter aircraft available, they just don't approach us anymore. Think from Royal Jet side, there's a bit of both. There is, there are new customers. Um, some new regions we're getting deeper into, some more Africa flying, Southeast Asian flying, that kind of thing, but also just more repeat customers flying more. So I think maybe the, you know, the budgets aren't quite as tight as they were a year and a half, two years ago. So there's some more activity happening with some repeat customers. Um, but I, one thing I'd have to say is, is a lot of the business these days comes through brokers. Uh, and that's something that we didn't see years ago either, is the, the broker market is very strong now. Yeah, I, 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 we see that through because we have a central broker desk that's based out of um, Luton that looks after really the global fleet. Um, and there's definitely a shift to brokers. So I think customers are, or owners and they're getting smart about you know using brokers now to get the best deals out there. Um, but it must be a good market as well because I see VistaJet you know, pretty active in the region um, and certainly there's a lot of aircraft that are always dropping in for maintenance so that's a, yeah. And so how do you guys feel about, you know, you're all based in the region, you're all committed to it, how do you feel about, bear in mind that some of the room, foreign operators coming over here and taking your charter? I could speak to that one if you like. As, as a local charter operator that's invested locally, and, and, and you know, we, we've had this discussion before, we have a heavy cost base here. In terms of having an AOC in, in here, having A6 registered aircraft, it, it's not cheap to do that here. So having foreign operators come in and park an aircraft and, and hunt for the business, and, and that, when we can't do that in a, in a foreign jurisdiction, that's a big thorn in our side, because it, it will eventually, if it's allowed to continue, drive companies like us either out of business or to move our operations to other areas where it's lower cost to operate. Our customers don't demand an A6 aircraft necessarily, so why do we have an A6 aircraft? Why are we spending the money here? So we spend a lot of time talking to the, to the government entities, to the different regulators, to try and level that playing field, but uh, the, 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 the issue that the, the new rules that came out in December from the GCAA actually made it easier for foreign operators because they took away the parking uh, restriction here. I think if the aviation industry in the UAE has to grow, they'll have to allow foreign operators because there's so many other aspects. The airports need to grow, reviews need to grow, MROs need to grow. Yes, as an operator, we have to take that hit and come out with different solutions. But if industry has to grow, we have to allow foreign operators to be and I'm not sure I fully agree with you there. Um, I think we also just need to expect a certain level of protection in our own backyard. As Alice said, it's an expensive, uh, it's an expensive business to run. Um, we maintain and service, you know, Vista Jet aircraft and Air Hamburg aircraft, and we're happy for them to come visit us for charge. Uh, and you know, as we've spoken about this subject for the last 10 years, I'm fairly tired of it, and as Mike has explained, We've all kind of moved on into you know proper management of airplanes, and if, if there's charter on the side, that's great. It's not going to change the landscape. I'm happy that people like Rob and them are doing it. They probably have a, 
the great to say with the GCA than we do, but um, uh, we're about done with having that discussion really, but it's, it's not right. It won't be right ever. So you're bored, but unhappy. Yeah, I'm permanently unhappy, never. Okay. It's really an issue that has multiple sides to it because our FBO benefits from these aircraft being here, of course, but, and the airports benefit it and that kind of thing, but our charter business doesn't. So it's, it's how, do you, how do you address that in a fair way with maybe an NOC process or, or something like that to, that has some protection for local operators, but it's up to the government entities and what they want to do. Are they just looking to bring more traffic or are they looking to, to have a balance? Of course, the, this is a nice question for the audience. Um, the other option is Middle Eastern owners could just move away from A6 towards Maltese or Aruba. Well, they have already. And, um, and just going back, can anybody remember the last two charter companies that started up in Dubai? Or Abu Dhabi for that matter? They don't exist anymore. When's the last time somebody actually made a success of it? Some people only fly a charter on the T7, for instance. So the question is out there, indeed. Do we need A6? Yes. Any answer? That's the question. I don't have to start yeah. yeah. answering yet. Yeah. I think for the moment we do, yes. And I think the government, coming back on the foreign uh, registered aircraft, not to be commercial aircraft, they're definitely tracking everything quite precisely. I'm not exactly sure what they do with the data. Um, but as Richard said as well, it's a give and take. It has happened since years. And there's benefits as well if you have an FBO, if you have a maintenance and, uh, and, and a hangar park. Center like we have, so there's nothing new basically. So there's a nice um, segue from this. So you, you've got operators from abroad coming over. Mike, I don't know if you noticed, but there was a big deal in January where some maintenance got sold to Dasso. Um, so how does the there's a question from the audience? How does the Falcon Dasso take over affect Bombardier MRO's services often in Dubai? Well, I think changes. Um, it's, it's common practice that MRO facilities, uh, like operators around the world, have a mix of, of aircraft that they support. And this transaction was carefully thought out with the implications on other manufacturers as well. Um, and at this point in time, we don't foresee any change. Um, from any of the manufacturers to say, hang on, we need to relook this at uh, this present time. But it is interesting, isn't it? You, you okay. guys are all reliant on maintenance, yeah. and there's a trend for, we well, are not so reliant on maintenance, though, but there is a trend for OEMs to move in, and we saw it with Jet Aviation buying Port Pacific, yeah. and we've seen Dasso buying TAG as well as Integra Jet. Do you guys worry that the OEMs are going to want to dominate maintenance? Um, before the transaction, yeah, you're right, that was happening because we saw it happen in Singapore, we saw it happen in China, where ExecuJet had invested in a big maintenance facility there. Um, concern going forward, to tell you the truth, Alistair, all I've got to do now is worry about how I get a maintenance service to my managed aircraft um, and leave that to the DASA boys to worry about. But you guys have all got maintenance, you three have got maintenance. Yes. I, I think it's a good thing, you know, um, it's, it's nice to have the OEM options around, um, so new facilities and vegan and what's coming up in Farnborough is going to be good for all of us to give us options for base maintenance. Um, you know, Gowan doesn't generally do a lot of base maintenance, especially on new warranty covered aircraft, so our bread and butter is more in line maintenance and, you know, fast support uh, to, to remote areas. When we do base maintenance, it's normally on older aircraft as well, which we do much of in Bournemouth. So, you know, there's always been a lack of maintenance availability, so it's happy with it. So do you see that the future will be for an independent MRO, you're not going to get warranty work, you're not going to be an authorised service centre, you're going to have to focus on the old and legacy aircraft that the OEMs don't want? Yeah, I think so. But, but you can still do warranty work under certain conditions, um, covered by programmes and things like that. But um, we're not going to go up against Bombardier, Goldstrom and DAF, so really. But I think the OEMs are going to be smart about this. It all depends on what the fleet size in each region is for them. Um, and it may make perfect sense to just be status quo rather than big regions where they may take a different view. Well, they do wonder then whether Bombardier is going to want that so service in their aircraft. 
I'm, I'm looking at my Bombardier friends and I'm getting no indication at all from them. <laughs> okay. One of the benefits of Alistair. That's why the new players like us got him. <laughs> One of the benefits though, Alistair, of course, as a, just even if you're doing your own maintenance, is the more that the, the manufacturers do this, the larger the spares will probably be in, in, the, in the region. So access to spares is very important, and, and the more that's locally here, the happier we are. Even if you have to pay more for them. Well, no. <laughs> but Alistair, to, your, to that point, it also has been very happy with Jet Aviation doing their maintenance in Dubai at this point in time, so why should the mindset change? Yeah, I, 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 I think we should see change. You know, Bombardier used to support a big one in five aircraft. Um, they're saying by like 2020 they want to do 50%. So I think, I think we're seeing a sea change when, and, 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 and you know, and you do one that out on independence. Yeah, it, it doesn't distract from the point that OEMs are clearly taking a new view on it. Yeah. But, but still, I feel perhaps in this period of a bit of upheaval in the maintenance uh, business, um, we hope to get perhaps a bit of positive you know, input in, in more maintenance. We tend to maintain the aircraft we operate, various types. As I said before, we're getting more into the, the bigger aircraft market, ACJ, BBJ, together with uh, Lufthansa Technique. And for the heavier check, we still have our, our headquarters in Stuttgart as well, which we work actively together with. So I see a silver lining in all these changes and, and having operator and maintenance centers uh, still have a, a sizable slice of the market. Alistair, if I can just on that point with the whole transaction for Executjet as operator now, it's going to be interesting for us how we change our strategy going to market. Because we've always had the comprehensive solution, which we've always sold and you know, built our strength on, and now we have a still a brand alongside us that we hope nothing changes and we can keep that aircraft management model going. But um, in some cases, you know, having that comprehensive has worked for us. Sometimes it's worked against us. But our challenge as we go through 2019 now is trying to get the market to understand the subtle differences that may come out from this and how we as a operator need to change our marketing strategy. There's a quick question about MRO. How might big data affect MRO opportunities? Predictability, routine, other effects? Any questions? Okay. Uh, uh, I'll, you know, I, I haven't made it to one of your revolution um, shows. I would like to go to it. I know people are talking a lot about how you can you know, leverage blockchain technology to traceability of aircraft parts and things like that. I mean, it's already a massive big data business, uh, aircraft maintenance and, and recording of that, but there's still a lot of paperwork that goes on. Um, so you know, it will feature massively in it, but there are people smarter than me who will figure it out. Good, uh, thank you for cross-promoting. Um, by the way, if anyone would like to ask an old fashioned question, we do have a microphone if anyone um, would prefer to do old school. Um, could the panel comment on opportunities originating from Saudi Arabia? I think there are opportunities, definitely. I mean, a couple of weeks ago, two, three weeks ago, there was the first uh, complete Saudi air show. And I think, uh, surprisingly, it was very positive. We really could feel there's a change in the market. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful that, that Saudi Arabia basically uh, becomes a bigger factor again in, in the region in terms of aircraft buying and flying. And I think we need that at the moment because the UAE has been, you know, relatively flat. So perhaps that can kickstart the whole operations again. We've seen activity from the Saudi market in, in, on the charter side, uh, for sure this year, coming from the government mostly. So there's, there's lots of activity. <coughs> Events and, and things going on over there that they're putting on, there's the Aula, the Neon project, those kinds of things, um, and even just just as Paul said, being at the um, at the Saudi Air Show, there's a lot of interest, there's a lot of a lot of activity going on, but it is seems to be government for now, um, and and just the, the fact that they have a, a ministry of entertainment and a ministry of sport and this kind of thing now, they're they're trying to do a lot of activities both it seems for the, the Saudi population as well as to bring people in. So that seems to be driving some more uh, charter activity, at least. Well, that would caution against. Yeah. Air shows being a good guy. eBay's for the last 10 years has been focused 
optimistic and cheery. Sorry, Karen. So, I mean, there are 59 airports there in Saudi, so, and the air show was, you know, an eye opener. There's a big market there, internal transport, also business tech charter. So, we as a Falcon, we had a very positive response. FBO, MRO, business jet. So I think there's a big market there. So the flat in UAE, you know, you can be supplemented by a Saudi market. Yeah. Okay, another question from the audience. Is there an increase in aircraft sales in the region? And there's two ways to answer that. Are we seeing aircraft being exported from the region still to the US? Are we seeing more aircraft go out and come in? Yes. Yes. Same. Yeah, the old aircraft are leaving, but um, the more you talk to OEMs, and recently, I don't know if it was me, but it was something published that they reckon that yeah, the 2008-2009 high of 40 aircraft being delivered, um, they're forecasting 12, 13, 14 over the next three years, um, which to me is a positive sign given where we come from the last few years to have that many, and I know a lot of them are the new 7500s and then big aircraft like that coming in. Okay, are UEA, UAE operators and management companies looking into partnerships with Saudi operators? Yeah, absolutely, we, we do. Yes. That's an interesting part, yes. Well, we've, we've already established an affiliate company in, in, in Jeddah that's, that's going really well. Um, but we encourage everybody to look into that because um, it drives the entire market. Do you see enough private jet financing? And is there enough finance available? Or is it an issue? Well, you know, earlier we said uh, of, of, of the new buyers, the first time buyers quite often is, is uh, pre owned aircraft and it's smaller deals. And for those kind of aircraft, it's difficult to find financing. Uh, I think there is financing, but it's much easier to finance a 20 million plus uh, brand new or less than five year old aircraft. Once you start with a 15 year old, uh, 5 year old or aircraft, it's a different uh, story. If you're financing a 5 million dollar aeroplane, you probably shouldn't buy it. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll take your customer then. <laughs> I think it's something that um, regular banks, not traditional aircraft financers, I've seen seem to have more of an appetite than, than they used to. Years ago when I was in Saudi, it was okay, the bank is willing to do it, but they don't know the asset at all, so you had to go to an asset knowledgeable lender, whereas these days even just the, the commercial banks seem to be okay with the asset, with, the, with the, the, how it holds its value, that type of thing, and they're interested. Okay, here's a nice question. If you could all get together and do one thing as operators, what would it be? Collusion. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> that's a tough one. But I think the one thing that we should strive for, and, and we kicked off a few, I think it was late 2017, 2018, we tried to get together as operators around the table just to have a social chat. And I think to set standards and try to uphold standards, and with standards goes an expected pricing because we're all under pressure on margins. Aircraft management is not big business. And I think we have to set standards of expectation of what you need to pay for the service of keeping your aircraft running. I mean, we must share our resources, but we pilot the MRO services to pay anything. It, we must tell you we should not compete. I think that's the only way to go. Yeah, in addition to that, we could also work a little bit harder together to advocate for this business in general. I mean, I don't see many aircraft owners in this room to work harder to engage them to get them to understand what we actually do for the money they really pay us. Um, and potentially, you know, as an industry, it'd be nice to have an industry association that does it for us, but we can do it ourselves as well. Okay, quick questions, quick fire, because I want to get on to people. Um, you can answer this in one or two words. Do you feel there is better business opportunities in Dubai or Abu Dhabi? I have to say Dubai, right? There's just more activity over here by far. I think Abu Dhabi is catching up now. I thought you'd pay for shelter. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, is lack of local charter aircraft increasing costs for users? Uh, 
and, there, is the, and therefore decreasing activity. There's no lack of local charter aircraft. Okay. They come from all over the place to, to park here and, uh, and offer their service. Okay. Um, is there any possibility of relaxed regulations from local authorities? Do you actually want relaxed re regulations? Yeah. Okay. I don't know. I think I disagree with that. In, in terms of you know the, the U.S. Part 91, Part 135, 121 type thing, it would be nice to see something like that here. Especially, I mean, we're, we're not a, a private operator, we're a commercial operator, but those of you who are aircraft management, um, your, your foreign registered aircraft and, and that sort of thing, they maybe have those capabilities, more flexibility, say on flight time limitations and things like that. I'd love to see something like that here where there's a differentiation between an ad hoc, non-scheduled operator and the airline. We all get treated like the airlines here. Yeah, it would be nice to see a bit more cooperation between the civil aviation authorities between the different countries, I would say. Notably UAE and Saudi Arabia. That would help. Because the harder it is here, I mean, we, we've talked about there's been operators disappear. With various reasons, but the cost of doing business here is one of them. You see you operators go out of business, it's one of the things. If they don't have enough charter business, if they can't compete, then the, the cost base just kills you. Okay, our new business models, shuttle, um, sharing, getting any traction in the region? I don't see that happening. It has been tried to get it again, and it's yeah. just not happening, or just not profitable enough to be sustainable. <laughs> this, I think it's not happened, but it's still a possibility. I think there's more and more, sorry, I've been talking about, there's more and more, um, empty legs being sold or only live leg stuff being done in the charter market and when you're just charging a live leg there's not really room for that that sharing model because the rate you have to pay on a live leg is very high so the whole the whole sharing model is okay when there's a cheap empty leg great we'll buy that empty leg and we'll sell all the seats on that that works nicely there isn't so much in the way of empty legs these days okay people how easy is it finding talent and staff to come and work for you. I think it's difficult, especially um, on the pilot side, where we tend to have the biggest turn in people. And I think it's really just the geographics of the region. We're not a Europe or a North America where there are qualified pilots type-rated to what you require sitting on the doorstep. So everybody we recruit is most mostly coming from abroad and it's a whole relocation of a family or a overcoming the safety issues. Uh, I, I would agree to some extent that <coughs> you know, the supply is also affected by you know, a, a market that's, that's not easy to predict and you know, if you're a pilot and you want to relocate your family out here, um, you have to ask yourself how long is this job going to last for? You know, unfortunately, in many, many situations, um, uh, the pilots lose their jobs if an aircraft sold out of reach. It's, it's, it's massively destabilizing. So, you know, what I'm saying, I've had three or four friends this year call up to say the owners decided to sell the airplane and we got anything going. It's, it's, it's very difficult for them. So a lot of them are, are opting to, to rather go to airlines or low-cost carriers um, to do that. But the, good talent's around. Um, you need to pay a little bit extra for it um, and you need to invest into them. But we don't have a major problem finding it. The demographics have changed, you know, the people are coming from other resources, but of course it's still difficult, but it's still possible. I don't know if, sorry, Paul, I don't know if Captain Roman, you have this issue, but in, in Abu Dhabi our issue is a bit different. I was talking to Paul about it outside. It's not finding the talent, it's actually getting them in before they, they find another opportunity because our timing in, in Abu Dhabi takes months and months to get someone in to get through the authentications and the equivalencies and the security checks and all that kind of thing, it can take six months and more for us to hire someone. So whether it's a pilot or an engineer or, or anyone licensed sort of, sort of uh, um, individual, we can find them, but then by the time we get to the point where everything's been done, they've already accepted another job somewhere else. So we're, we're again lobbying the government in, in Abu Dhabi to speed up that process or shortcut that process in some way. Right now it's also a pilot's market. And one of the things we face in the region, especially first offices that you need uh, to bring into region, they want to get their hours up, understandably, to get to captain. 
easiest way to do that in this pilot's market is the commercial airline is hiring. They'll pop across there for four or five years, get sufficient hours, and then come back and then maybe pick up a captain position. <laughs> the pilot market, the airline market, is, is, is competitive. It can be very attractive. Mm -hmm. On a general uh, HR market, I think there's always a lot of candidates. It's the quality of the candidates is not always there. So uh, it's, uh, it's not getting easier. But there's a question for you, it's operators seem to have unrealistic expectations of pilot qualifications that don't add to safety compared to the US or EU, especially for first officers. Is this client driven? It's, it's not client driven. I think, you know, Mike mentioned earlier that we need to have, you know, some form of standards and I know most of our, you know, standards and they, they, they're not onerous. You need, you know, a couple hundred hours to be a, a, a co-pilot. It's not that crazy. Interested to hear more about that question. Sometimes it is uh, only expectations that you want certain hours on the aircraft. Um, and then it also depends on uh, the balance of the crew that's on that aircraft as well. What do you need to balance out? Any old school questions or comments from the room? You'll be pleased to know, as you're speaking, you've managed to make 63% more pessimistic. <laughs> uh, nice job, Mike. <laughs> Everybody on the mic, maybe. Um, okay, final question. Mike, this time last year, you said 2018 was going to be rubbish. You're now saying it was rubbish. What's 2019 going to be like? <laughs> well, 2019 has, has got a whole new curveball with a certain transaction, as you mentioned. Um, but no, I'm, we see positive signs already, and, and, and last year when I said it was rubbish, it was really driven about the fallout from Saudi Arabia and Qatar and the FBO business and the drop in traffic to our MROs. We are definitely seeing and are projecting a 5% growth on our FBO movements through the year. Um, the managed fleet will always be a challenge, but no, I think we're very optimistic that this year will be better than last year. I mean, Expo 2020, of course, I don't want to all say it, but again, that's from the corner. I think our FBO business, MRO business will grow, charter will be stable, so we are okay. And I still, maybe I'm too skeptical, but I still don't see how Expo is going to make that big a difference in private charter business. I mean, okay, we have been involved in the helicopter market there, so we have been asked to do that. But private check, I mean, Maybe there will be more movements for tomorrow and FBO. Yeah. That's all it is, Alistair, from historic events around the world. The build up to it, it's just those visiting business jets that come in that six months prior to and a few months after. So it's really just about movements. Okay, sorry, I was being optimistic. Yeah, you know, um, <laughs> we're just going to keep keep our means uh, down and work hard, build the, the Saudi business that we started up and you know, finish this business aviation centre in charge see what it's like at the end of the year. So better or less works? Working to get better. Is this you as a stock exchange to come and be not giving board guidance? <laughs> not at all. Uh, I think it's a tough year but uh, we keep on growing and we keep on look, looking positively outward. I'm optimistic that it will uh, improve further. And from our side, um, three months in the books, so far so good, even better than last year, so hopefully that's a trend that keeps going. Um, I'd rather not hear what, uh, what I heard outside of somebody saying that it's fallen off a cliff, so I <laughs> hope the little cliffs will come and fall off of, but so far so good. Okay, we're going to end quick fire. Last questions um, from the audience. Rob, why no small and medium sized aircraft in the region? You seem like the least qualified person for that one. Yeah, I mean, there are, there are so many Vista jets and, and that sort of thing coming through that there's a lot of options that, that people have. They have the single legs and, and that kind of thing. So, you know, I know from Royal Jet's perspective, from our, uh, our strategy, we're not looking to buy any more small jets or put anything else in the fleet that side because there is global competition with those aircraft sizes, whether it's managed aircraft or own. Or Anyone else? We have not seen light jets. No? Okay. <laughs> Definitive answer from Richard. Um, do your, here's a nice question from VistaJet, 
Do your charter management companies have a branding challenge when compared to others like VistaJet? It's true, isn't it? it there's very few big brands in this situation. Yeah, I, I think it's an amazing product. You know, it's, it's something that we will find very hard to compete, you know, like for like with. So we, we are not a charter operator. We, we manage aircraft and sell to them in the lift to people. Yeah. Uh, VistaJet is doing one, one thing and is doing that quite well. We, we tend to do multiple things, so yes, the brand might not be as worldwide, but still we need locally and regionally to have a good brand. Okay, final question. Describe your job in one word. <coughs> Rob, you've got it, see. Facilitation. Just facilitating the business model. I want to two words, challenging and fun. You should combine them. relationships. That's two words. <laughs> I can't really listen to you, it's managing expectations. Frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> and on that, thank you very much.